right, guys. Uh, welcome to uh, Too Many Cooks, supporting augmented teams without getting salty. Uh, my name is Stephanie Alhaj. I will be your presenter for the duration of this session. Um, as you can tell from the great high music that I had playing before we started, uh, there are some good things and some bad things about uh, Too Many Cooks. One of the good things is that they have theme music. Uh, the bad thing is the rest of the session. <laughs> Uh, so, to get started, uh, let's talk about Salty. Um, I learned after I had presented, after I had submitted the session that some people didn't know what that meant. Apparently it is a newer word. Um, so I provided the definition so that we're all on the same page uh, about what this means. Um, to be upset or bitter, to feel darkness in your belly when you are encountering the thing that is upsetting you is to feel salty. Um, typically not a positive thing and uh, associated with poor experiences to set the stage for this session. Um, so to give you also um, an idea for people who are not familiar with augmented teams, um, I found a video that can better describe or show in the wild um, what an augmented team uh, can look like and why you would want to have one. Sullivan family disappeared in Barbados eight hours ago. In a case so big. The family's three countries in three years. It will take two teams to solve it. Our better years. We'll flip for it. So the takeaways from that is that uh, one team was not able to solve the problem on their own, and so they needed to bring in a second or augmented team to support them in the web. Um, so so this is pretty normal, like you have it in all, uh, in all kinds of instances. You can have it in web development, you can have it uh, in the criminal justice system. It's very diverse and all over, and they just don't always call it augmented teams, but they're all over. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, myself so that you know why I am uh, capable of standing up here and telling you about augmented teams. Um, I'm a project manager for Amazy Labs. Amazy Labs is a uh, web development agency here, well, not here, uh, in Austin, Texas, Zurich, Switzerland, and Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, we've been around for seven years. We just, or no, 10 years. We just had our Amazy 10 um, last year. And um, as you can tell, I'm into trashy TV dramas uh, involving crime. Um, yeah. So uh, before, when I've done uh, presentations, I've uh, I tend to stick kind of to the same subjects. I talk about touchy-feely things rather than like tangible takeaway type of things. Um, either because of my role as a project manager or just because it's really hard to say, here's a specific thing, go and take this and apply it to your lives because everybody's situation is very different. Um, so I tend to be more like, here's a general combination of words. Let's try to get you to uh, internalize them and adapt them to your life. So uh, when I first did a presentation, um, I did it on uh, recruiting and retaining volunteers. You can basically change out volunteers to be teams because the components and the elements of that are all very similar. Um, you want to make sure that the people that you're working with are awesome. You want to make sure that they're also very happy and you want to make sure that they have uh, a great team dynamic working together. The second talk I did was how Amazie Labs went agile. Um, it took us like two years to learn how to do it, but I think we're in a pretty good place. Um, so this third talk is kind of an amalgamation of those two things um, being put to the test with an outside influence, an augmented team uh, that we started working with. So I kind of like how all my topics merge together. Um, like I mentioned before, uh, your mileage may vary with, with the content of my talk. Um, obviously, it's very specific to my situation, um, but there should be a lot of things that are similar to your work life. Um, as a note, this is the actual uh, terms and conditions from Drupal.org. Take a moment to really bring that in. <laughs> um, so a little bit more about Amazing Labs, um, just to give you an idea of what we do. Um, we are distributed, and we're used to working with people from uh, different countries. We have people in three hubs, but we actually have employees all over the world. We have a guy in Tunisia. I don't know where that is, but I know that it's far. Um, so we're used to working uh, remotely. We're used to working with people with different backgrounds, uh, different time zones, like all kinds of things that would normally make like daily life uh, confusing, awkward, difficult until you figure it out. Um, that's our normal life, and so we kind of have a step up, um, I think, from a lot of agencies who might just have uh, companies who uh, are all in the same location. Um, so that makes working as a, with an augmented team um, a lot more easier because we've already figured out some of those hard things um, along the way. So how do you know if you want to augment your team? So when I first presented this, um, people thought that it meant 
if Amazie wanted to augment their team, and that's not what this is about. So this is from the client side um, of hiring. So this is the flowchart of, I have either an internal web agency, or I have an internal dev team, or not. Odds are you have an internal dev team, and you have a big project coming up that you want to release, and so now you're stuck with this, this decision tree of, do I want to add to my team, do I want to hire someone, or do I want to pay someone else to come in and kind of pick this up for me? Um, so the decision tree says, uh, do I have enough internal resources to do this? Yes. Does my team have the skill uh, necessary to make this happen? Because you might have tons of bodies, but like if they don't know how to do, for example, React, and you're trying to do a React project, you're not able to do that, and so you want, want to bring someone in. Um, if you don't have the resource to do it, or you have the resources, but they're busy doing something else, um, you might want to bring in an, an external team as well, just to make sure that you can accomplish um, the project. Another option is actually bringing in freelancers, um, but if you already don't have the resources because, the, because your internal team is busy with other things and you don't have time to onboard a freelancer or babysit the freelancer, then you'll also want to think about bringing in an external team who can work um, independently. Um, yeah. So let's talk about teams. So before you can start adding other people to your team, you need to kind of know what the dynamic is of your own team. So Amazie Labs Austin works very differently from Amazie Labs Zurich and Amazie Labs Cape Town. We know this, and for that reason, when we start doing uh, intercompany work, we know specifically like what quirks that we need to incorporate to make that work life um, transition easier. So, for example, with our team, we have a very specific set of uh, scrum rituals that we follow that vary just ever so slightly from our other teams. Um, on Mondays, we do uh, specification and planning, which is our review of all the things that need to be done and talking about those. Um, on Tuesday, we do all of our uh, normal scrum rituals like uh, sprint planning and sprint estimation um, and retrospective. And so we have, like, we also do daily stand up So we have these things. Um, in our everyday life that kind of set the rhythm of what we do uh, during a sprint, which is two weeks for us. And so everyone kind of knows the role that they play in that. We have uh, a scrum master, we have a regular dev team who kind of do diverse things, uh, we've got a designer, and then we have me who plays the role of PM. They have POs, but like, it's the same thing, so don't worry about it. Um, so the other thing about our team is that we do certain things because we know how the other people on the team um, interact. Like we know that if we want to have someone do a technical design review, we take it to X person. If we want to have someone do uh, like a very back-end heavy uh, tech review, we take it to another person. So we're all very comfortable with uh, each person's role in the team so that we kind of work like a well-oiled machine. We don't think about it. It's like when you go into a kitchen, um, if you're in a well-run kitchen at a restaurant, you won't hear them talking. They just sort of know when you know so and so has the oven open, they do this. When so and so has a knife in their hand, they do this. And so it's all very like musical and really nice to watch. When you go into a kitchen and there's people shouting at each other and fires and things like that, like you know that they don't have that same kind of rhythm. And so the first scenario is kind of what you want your team to be like. You want them to be uh, calm and know what everyone is doing and, and be able to. Um, just kind of trust that everyone is taking care of their parts. Um, so when you bring in people who are not part of your team um, or are new, so think about like the last time you hired someone and you brought that person into your team, they always bring things that are unique to themselves. So uh, they might leave comments in Jira tickets differently. They might not use GIFs. I don't know why you hired them, but they might not use GIFs. <laughs> Um, like the, each person when you bring them in has quirks and that those quirks that they bring in change the dynamic of your team and so like if you've ever seen a company's hiring they usually try not to hire big groups of people at one time because when you do that you can either dilute like the company culture that you currently have going on um, in good or bad ways usually bad ways but it makes it so that when people come in they don't know which culture that they're watching that they should be absorbing um, so the same thing happens with one person, you bring them in, and what you want to do is you want to make them as, like, as part of your team as quickly as possible without disrupting the rest of the team. So with augmented teams, you basically take that one new hire and you like infinitely uh, grow it. So instead of bringing in one new person that you have to make like follow your way of life, you have five, six, seven, eight new people. And that's what happens to us. 
So when you bring in an augmented team, it's basically the Brady Bunch. You have one team, one family who's used to doing things in a certain way, and you have another team or another family who's used to doing things in a different way. And they might be similar, you might both do Christmas, but one of them does uh, Christmas presents on Christmas Eve, the other might do it on Christmas morning. One, uh, one of the families might do brunch on Sundays, the other one might sleep in. So you have very similar starting setting circumstances, but when you combine them, you get problems, you get fights, uh, you get people who are wondering why this person thought it was okay to get skim milk instead of 2% milk. People get upset and you have hurt feelings. Um, and all of these things are simple miscommunications and just a matter of like figuring out how to make them not affect your life so badly. But at the beginning, it's always going to be problematic. So needless to say, when we started our augmented project, um, we made a lot of mistakes. Uh, we learn the hard way uh, that when you bring in a new team that things change, the dynamic of the team, teams change, uh, and the way that you currently do your work uh, will need adjustments. Like you won't just be able to continue uh, life as it was. So I'm very pro um, augmented teams now, um, but at the time of this, uh, of this project, it felt very differently. So this presentation is going to be a lot of, here's what we did, uh, maybe don't do that, um, and here's how we resolved it at the end. And no cats were actually harmed in the making of this. So the first mistake that we did uh, is that we made assumptions about what it was going to be like to work with this other team. Um, when we normally bring on a new project, uh, we kind of give the ground rules. We, we go in and we say, hey, we're Amazing Labs, here's how we do things, here's blah, 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 we're going to follow all of these steps. And at the end, you're going to get a website. Great, yay. And we tried doing that with this project, and we forgot that the other team hadn't ever been on a project with us before. And so all these things that we thought that were just normal in the way of doing uh, business hadn't been communicated to them. And so the first thing that we did wrong is we said, give us one person on your team who's going to be the product owner for your team. And whoever that person is, is going to be the one point of contact that we talk to uh, to make decisions and to tell us what we're going to be building and blah, blah, blah. And it made sense to us. Like you want to have one point of contact that you're talking to so that you're not having like 50 people tell you what to do. The problem is, is that that person heard what we were looking for and interpreted it through their way of doing business and we were given the wrong person. We found this out a few months into the project. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that was the, the, the first biggest problem that we encountered. Um, and the rest of the mistakes that we made kind of fall out of this being um, that decision. So when you have a project, you want to make sure, especially from a project manager's project manager's perspective, is that you know who's driving the bus. Um, and this is not the same as who's in charge. There is a difference. Um, you want to have one person who makes sure that like the notes are done, that there is a repository for things, that like the the notes are picked up, and that everyone's kind of on the same page for things. And then you also want to have one person who can say yes and no to things. And we didn't have any of that defined. The problem was is that on our side we had a PM and on their side they had two PMs. One of those PMs was also the PO. And so we had three people, all who were supposed to kind of do the same thing and all who weren't doing the same thing. And so like balls were getting dropped and people were getting confused about whose role was what. Um, and it was also really difficult for the people who were also in the two teams to know who to look to when there was a question or um, should we move forward with this? Are we okay with the budget? Uh, it was really problematic, and uh, it wasn't just at the PO level and the PM level that this was happening. So on the project side, we had uh, eight people uh, who attended all the meetings, and at the beginning, we knew what their roles were because they had titles, but we didn't actually know what those roles meant because no one was playing their part at these meetings that we were having um, because it wasn't clear what everyone should be doing at those meetings. Um, so what was happening is that there was no direct, um, there was no one to look at when, when decisions needed to be made. And so people would offer up suggestions and be like, well, what about this? What about this? And it made it very difficult for people to, for us to move forward uh, with the project. It was just very, uh, no one wanted to step on anyone else's toes, but no one wanted to be the leader. It just was a mess. The other problem is that we spent a lot of time building a RACI. Uh, and if you don't know what a RACI is, it's uh, responsible, accountable, something, something. It's totally useless because it's a document that if you don't look at and you don't use, it's just 
something that you build and then you put it away and then no one ever looks at it and it's a huge waste of time. But <laughs> uh, what that did is, is, it, is it gave people an idea that they did have a role, which was also confusing because we never actually referenced those roles that we did in the RACI. Um, so that you had this guidebook that existed somewhere and then you had real life that wasn't matching up uh, with the documentation. So the other problem is that we didn't know where we were going. So if we look at this like a project, we had a team that we had to do the work. We had people telling us what to do, kind of. Um, and we also knew that at the end of the project, we needed to be able to deliver uh, something that the client could use. The problem was is that there was no defined end goal, uh, which sounds very odd. Usually that's something that you would have. Um, but there was this idea that everyone knew what was going on, but no one actually knew what was going on. The problem was is that they had a checklist of all the things that they wanted to have done, uh, and we kept saying, is this in priority order? And they would say yes, but the problem was is that everything was a priority. It was just a matter of like what hit the spreadsheet first. None of it was actually prioritized by this must happen. All of it must happen, and it was a very, very, very long list. So what was happening is that if you look back at the beginning, all those people who didn't have an actual defined role, all those people who didn't know whether or not they had the authority to tell people what to do or to say, hey, maybe you should keep working on that, they just did. So what was happening is that the dev team was constantly pushing out work and they were giving it to people to look at and saying, is this what you wanted? And depending on who they gave it to, the person either said, yes, that's what I wanted, or no, can you go add a new button? Or no, can you make this blue? Or this thing should be taller over here. And so you had the, the dev team being like, okay, well, I, no one said I shouldn't do that, so I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna go spend time on this. And so we spent so many hours working on stuff that at the end of the day, like nobody cared and it was gonna get changed <laughs> anyway. Uh, and so we ended up wasting all this time that could have been spent like building actual things for the project. The other problem, because there was a lot, <laughs> is, is how are we going to get to the end? So everyone had an idea of what we were building, but there was no defined path to get there. So going back to the idea of everything in the checklist is a priority, things were getting handed to the team and saying, you know, here, go ahead and build this, here, go ahead and build this, here, go ahead and build this. And the team was picking up tickets and doing the work, but it was kind of like blindfolding carpenters and saying, you know, go in here and build the basement. And then this other person's gonna be over here like painting a window. What, there's no way to know what's actually being built because there's no big picture. There's no way to say like, oh, okay, we're building the basement because the next thing we're gonna do is build a first floor. It was, I'm building a basement and you're doing that. So I think it's a house, but I don't, I don't know. So that was very confusing and it, and it was really disheartening because the team never knew how close we were to the finish line. It was just a matter of being like, well, I, I think eventually this will look like something and everyone will be happy. The other problem is that decisions were being made in documentation. And decisions cannot be made in documentation unless there's people associated with it who know that those decisions are being made and then they're being documented and where the documentation actually is. So what was happening is that some people had a big picture and they were writing it down and they were updating Confluence and they were relying on Confluence's notifications that something had been updated to inform the rest of the team that a decision had been made, which if you're familiar with like Jira or Confluence, you get a thousand emails anytime someone does anything. You're never gonna see that documentation change. The other problem is, is that if you're writing something down and then having other people read it and hoping that they read it, is that you get absolutely no consensus. You have one person, two people maybe, sitting in a room saying, here's the thing that we're gonna build, and then handing it off to a team and hoping that there's nothing wrong with what they're putting on paper. And if you've ever worked with a team, like even if you're looking at a design for the homepage, you're gonna find 50 things wrong with that. You always need to make sure that you talk to people and that wasn't happening. Um, the other problem is, is that, going back to that idea of prioritization, is that we were so proud that we were doing Agile, like Maisie does Agile, we are so proud of the way we do this, that the clients get what they want and the team is really happy, but that was not actually what was happening. We were taking all of these, well, so what was happening is that we were getting uh, all the tickets through the end of the project were written before we even started the project. 
which if you've done a project in an agile way, that's a huge no-no because things change in an agile project. While you're working on something, you might have been told, hey, we really need to have a contact form, but as you're developing, as you're designing, you might be like, you know what, contact forms are hugely outdated, let's never do that. And then it's gone, so there's like 50 tickets suddenly that you need to remove from your, your Jira installation. So that was what was happening here, is that we had, so we do, uh, in, in our Jira uh, system, we've got um, the current sprint, the next sprint, and maybe a third follow-up sprint, just to kind of help get our arms around like lots of big ticket items. But what was happening is that we had 12 sprints identified in Jira, and like each of those sprints had like a block of tickets that were supposed to happen during each of those, and the tickets had been written by someone who was using very, for me, archaic like terminology for everything, and so we would look, you know, 12 sprints in the future and say, I don't know what this ticket is. I have no idea what this ticket, this ticket is, but we're going to have to deliver it because that's apparently what we've committed to. So. Meanwhile, Amazing sitting there trying to say, okay, well, we have 12 sprints. We can make it work. We know what sprints are. Let's, let's get our arms around this and we'll keep being agile and this is fine. This is fine. And this is what it was actually like. So needless to say, the team was very stressed out. So let's let's recap where we've where we've come from. So uh, we were working with a project team. There was eight of them. Uh, we were delivering something. We had just made it through uh, the first of three increments of delivery. So something was already being pushed to production and being used by people. Uh, so we made it that far. We didn't fail uh, the first increment. Um, but we were still doing what we'd been doing. Uh, there was no real plan. We didn't know what increment two and three really looked like. We knew that there was spreadsheets with words on them, and eventually somehow we were going to figure out how to do it and when with the people that we had. Uh, and also during this entire thing, we had learned React because we had thought, you know, this thing that you're trying to build, it can be done in Drupal, but it shouldn't be done in Drupal because there's all these things involved. Uh, so let's, let's learn React so that we can build this in React and that you can have a cool new toy. So just picture like learning a new technology, a time box of this is due uh, in like nine months from now, and also everything is like low key on fire. It was not sustainable. The whole team was like, look, <laughs> if we're gonna keep doing this, something needs to change. And the good thing is, is that the, the other team also felt the same way. So we did something that was as a project manager and someone who's responsible for the income of our company, absolutely terrifying, we stopped the project. We literally stopped the project in November. Uh, the, the deliverable is due in April. For the entire month of December, an entire month, in the middle of critical parts of our project, we didn't do anything. Because we were like, you know what, we cannot keep building that, that thing to Mars. Like, that's just not gonna work. This isn't going to work for anyone. We have no idea like what's coming. We need to stop. And so what we did is we brought everyone to Austin. So everybody that we were working with was all living in a different state. And so everything that we were doing with them was all done remotely. And for the most part, that works fine. Like, most of our clients are not even in Texas. Uh, but the problem was is that a lot of the people that we were working with, we made the assumption, going back to assumptions, that they had all worked together before. 
we found out that the company is so big that like maybe two of them had actually worked together before and so they didn't actually have a team dynamic, at least in the way that we were expecting. And so they were also low-key sad and being like, what is happening? I've never been on a web project like this before. Like, why does it seem like no one knows what's going on? Why does it seem like I don't know what's happening next? And it was because it was, but they didn't know that because they hadn't done this before. And so we brought everyone down to Austin for a two-day, uh, and we had a lot of really great talks. And I think the biggest thing that, that, that made this work for us was that they wanted to change and we wanted to change. And so everyone was super open to the idea of saying, we did things one way before and we're never gonna do that again. And so we did what is hugely critical in Agile, and we had a huge retrospective. And this was the first time that people on this project, um, on the other side at least, had ever gotten to voice their, their sadness. Um, so it was a really good like bloodletting moment where everyone kind of bonded together and they were like, you hate this too? I hate this. Okay, great. Uh, and we also had this thing of like, if you're sad about something and you don't verbalize this is making me sad, you can't be sad about it. Like you have to say, this is bumming me out. I never want to do this again. So that we can say, oh, that is bumming you out. Let's fix that. Uh, and this was a huge way of, of getting that team together and saying these kinds of things because they're a very corporate um, company and that's just not something that is done. Uh, and then with our side to actually have the interaction um, with other people and say, hey, like, we're not perfect, we're not trying to sell you perfect, we're trying to sell you a really good product that you're happy with, but we also want you to be happy with it like during the entire process. Uh, so then the next thing that we did once everyone uh, had kumbaya and uh, done all the hugs around the circle is that we got everybody on the bus. Um, so in my very first talk about volunteers, I had an um, analogy about getting everybody in the boat. It's the same thing. Uh, this one just has more magic to it. But the idea is that you want your team to be in sync. You want people to be on the same page with things. You want people to feel invested in what's happening because, it, because they know what's happening uh, and they feel like they actually have a role to play in it. And this was... Um, it was critical for us to move forward to say, like, let's all agree that this is what we're going to be doing. The first thing that we did is that we, uh, we enforced that building a website is not like building a house. Like people always use this example of like building websites, like building a house. Like you can decide that you want a basement and a pool and whatever. Yeah, you can if you want to refactor and spend a bunch of money like going back and doing things that you did before because you didn't know that there was supposed to be a pool in the basement. Uh, so, so, so this is like my example of, you know, yeah, you've got two windows, but they looked like that. Because if you would have just told us that you wanted second story windows, we would have known that you wanted a second story. We could have built it so that it looked like a house and not just a combination of weird elements that do things. So once we got that out of the way, we were like, let's not like go and look at it as though something we can just add on later. Building a website is like a road trip. You're getting from point A to point B and you can stop as many times as you want and you can change direction as many times as you want as long as you're ending up at the place that you want to be. You can also change where you want to be, but that will change the project. The other thing is, is that when you're doing a road trip, you only have so much money, so much gas, and only so much time. If you want to go to Disneyland and like bring your kids or whatever and you're gonna be there for two days, you cannot do everything in Disneyland. Same thing with the road trip. You can do like five things maybe. You might be able to get to ride the roller coaster three times, but you have to prioritize. Before I leave, I'm gonna get on that roller coaster three times and spend five hours in the sun. Like that's how it's gonna be. So the same thing with the road trip. Like it can be as fun as you wanna make it, but you need to also know like, we're gonna start here, we're gonna end there. There's some options, but we also need to be okay saying those options are not, maybe not gonna happen this time. Like maybe we'll do a road trip in two years. Um, so, so going back to the vacation analogy, like this road trip thing is very critical for like making decisions in your everyday life. Like you can MVP everything. Like I can MVP my grocery store. Like you go there and you're like, I don't want to sit in line. So I'm going to make sure that whatever I do gets me into the 15 or less. Like I don't, I'm going to go do this, this, and this. I can get pasta next week. Like there's different ways that you can just be like, it's not important. Like let's be okay dropping things off the balloon. We also defined who's driving. We went around and we were like, okay, who wants to do this? Who's doing this? Who's doing this other thing? And then we also brought the correct person or people uh, into the PO role. So it was very apparent to us three months into the project that um, 
we had picked the wrong person to tell us yes and no to things. There was actually two people, and they were working in tandem for the business uh, to provide different sides, um, business logic and such, to what we were actually delivering. Uh, and we didn't realize how critical their role was until we were waiting for sign-off on something, and then they were, and then we heard like it's going to be like two or three weeks because they're on vacation. Like, who's on vacation? What? Oh, the person who's actually saying yes or no is not part of this. Uh, and so we had a conversation that was like, "What is it that you're building us?" And I said, "You don't know what we're building because we had this middle person that was translating what we were doing to the uh, to the, the visionaries." Um, who were the people who were ultimately responsible for this project happening. So there was this huge breakdown of, we thought the visionaries were being informed of things, but we thought that they were being informed of things and, like you would tell someone who was interested, like, oh, we're, we're working on this right now. Like, oh, great, how's that going? Um, what it actually was, was that they had a specific list of things that they needed to have accomplished. They weren't getting that list communicated anywhere. And so they were sitting in a room building like a very beautiful mind situation out of like stickies to the wall being like I want this this and this and none of that was being communicated to our Austin office and so when we brought them into um, when we brought them down to, to Austin we actually like basically had everyone else shut up and we put the visionaries in the front of the room and we were like these next three hours are yours tell us what you actually want this project to be and they were floored they were it, to them it had been it hadn't even occurred to them that they had this critical role um, also to their team, like their team didn't ever look at them and say, like you have this very critical role to the success of the project, we need to give you like the respect that that position deserves. And putting them in front of the room and giving them this platform was so critical to taking that giant list of things and throwing it out the window. We went from a, a list of probably 30 items down to 12. All we had to do was just get the right person like in front of the people and saying, this is what I actually want you to build for me. Uh, so the other really good thing about this is that it helped everyone figure out what the role was gonna be in, in one team unit rather than just two teams who happen to be shoved in bus together. And so I look at it as like, you know, you've got a soccer team, like not everyone can play goalie. So what are the roles that we're gonna be uh, doing so that everything is kind of filled? And this this sit down that we had helped define all of those different things. So we knew that, for example, when we're doing a ticket that's based on uh, design, this person, this person, and this person all have to see that ticket. They all have to sign off on it and in this order. It took our definition of done in our tickets and it doubled it, but it made it so much clearer of like what happens to this ticket, how does this ticket make it out the door. Um, the other thing that we did is we figured out where we're going. So we knew what those 12 items were gonna be, and we also knew who could change that. So now that we have these two visionaries identified, we say, here's the 12 things that we're gonna do. If we get to a situation where we're like, no, I don't need that anymore, or we get to a situation where we're like, we need to go add Indian rupees, and if we don't add Indian rupees, this project is going to fail. Like, they're the people who can say, I'll, make sh I'll shave things off the MVP list to make this happen. So now we had like a, an actual point of contact who could say, yes, no. We also defined where we're not going. We defined what we were not going to be doing. And that was also hugely important because you have 12 people at the table. All of these people have their own agenda of what they think is critical for delivery. And so when the visionaries are sitting there saying, you know, we don't need this, then everyone's aware of the fact that the visionaries don't want it and so they don't have to fight for it anymore. And that they also, like, if they actually wanted it for some other reason, they'll need to actually say words and say, well, it would be really cool if we did this and then give the visionaries a chance to say, yeah, that's not our problem, give it to another project team for something else to get delivered. Um, so it was really good for their side to say, like to, make, to bubble up all of these um, potential scenarios um, so that there was no one harboring a like secret thing that I'm going to get accomplished through this project, which actually was a thing. The other thing, I'm huge on verbalizing decisions, changes, whatever, and I hate this phrase because it sounds like a tour guide, but it's so good. Like if, if you're on a call, like people tend to like be on their laptops or they're you know looking at email or whatever, and so you don't know if they're actually listening even though they're physically present. And so what I do after any decision is I say, you know, I just wrote this thing down. Here's me sharing my screen of the thing that I just wrote down. I want to see heads nodding. We agree with this. We don't like it. We like it. Okay, we're moving on. 
And that's their one chance to say like, I saw what you did. I'm either agreeing or I'm not agreeing, but it's going back to that thing about the retrospective. If you don't say anything, your opinion doesn't count. Uh, and this actually has changed um, how people look at the project who've been attending. Um, the way that if you would have watched the rooms, like the video calls, you would have seen you know, six people on this side and six people on this side, most of whom are like checking Facebook or email or whatever, or not paying attention and just thinking of that meeting as a huge waste of time. But if you look at the, the calls now, people are active because they know that if they're not paying attention and their thing like passes them by, they don't get to go back. It really changed the dynamic of these, of these calls. Uh, the other thing is that we got into the specifics. So we had this like 12 list of MVP items and for us, like we would assume that when you want you know, this thing delivered, that you all are on the same page of what that actually means. We found out there was three items that no one agreed on. And so the idea that like we're gonna deliver a homepage, for example, like some person thought that like a homepage was like a landing page for a marketing campaign. Completely different than what another person thought it was gonna be. So we actually got into the specifics of, if you want this delivered, you tell me exactly what you think this is going to be and what you want to have in it. And from that, we were able to say, okay, you want to have this thing delivered. Uh, normally when that thing gets delivered, it has X, Y, Z component. And if you get Z component implemented, that's going to be really expensive and probably like kick one of your MVP items off. Do you still want it? And they actually got to go and say, oh, I didn't realize it was going to be so complicated. Let's ditch that. There's no reason for that. That's what we had, you know, the last website. We just thought it was something that we needed to carry through. Once they kind of realized that, that you know, their 12 items were negotiable, they started getting into it and they were like, okay, I get this, this is like a bartering thing. All right, let's exchange this and this and this. And then once we had our 12 done, we were able to actually pull from the remaining 30 and like pull things from it and say, okay, we have room now, let's go add this in there. And they started feeling empowered of what was actually gonna be built rather than these like helpless people watching the bus go past. The other thing is that they were having meetings on their side where things were being defined and that wasn't being relayed back to us. Kind of that idea of like, you know, they would have a decision and it would go die in documentation. They thought that if they had been in a meeting that like everyone had just sort of osmosis the information. Um, but what we learned, like what we shared with this is that, you know, if you know it, make sure that the guy next to you knows it. It's not redundant if he doesn't know it. Like make sure that you say it once and you say it to the right people. Otherwise we're gonna die in meetings. Like do it once, do it right, and then it's over. So now that we're you know, working together, um, we, had to do, we had to do things that, that a family would have to do after they've been merged. So uh, we, we got into everyday life rhythm. One of those things, uh, you can try this tonight at the party, uh, was learning to speak the same language. So we all speak English as our, as our uh, project language. Um, but you would think that two teams who do Agile say the same thing. We found out uh, very quickly that that's not the case. For example, we use Sprint to say two week period where we produce work and give you tickets. They use Timebox. That sounds like it's not like a you know, huge difference, but that's one of many uh, different, different uh, uh, uses of words that, that can easily derail progress. Another thing is like, if you're gonna say implement this, what does that mean? Does it mean build it? Does it mean theme it? What does it mean? So we learned to start breaking down words. Uh, the base, we learned to start breaking down ideas into like the simplest words to make sure that anybody who picked up tickets uh, would know exactly and immediately what was going on and be able to uh, agree, disagree, and test. Mister slash spark. They are trying to communicate. They are trying to connect. Chinese black market. Yes. 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 They are trying yes. to say the same thing. So it went from this idea of you know us versus them to let's figure out how we can actually work together and make the most out of this. Um, as a result, we learned how to share, which you know doesn't sound like a thing when you're adult. It's a huge thing when you're adult and you're very territorial of your like area of expertise. Uh, specifically, me and my PMs, we learned how to work together. We learned how to say uh, we would meet before meetings and say, "Hey, we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about this. Who's going to be in charge? Who's leading this? Who's taking notes?" So that when we went in, we had a united front with both teams, um, and we also knew like 
you are responsible for this going forward, I'm responsible for this going forward. Each person within the PM group had their role. Um, we also learned that we were not always gonna get our way. And because everyone was also not gonna get their way, it made it a lot easier to move forward and say, your deployment sucks. It makes me super unhappy. I'm gonna spend 17 hours with merge conflicts and it's gonna like, ruin the productivity of the sprint. But that's the way it's gonna be. Like, it's not gonna change because it's making me sad. So we learned how to deal with it. We still cry a little bit. Uh, but it's something that we've, we've uh, internalized and said, you know what, fine. Like, out of all the things that went wrong on the project and they're going well now, I can take this for the team. I can do that. Uh, the other thing is that you know, when, we're, when you're dealing with a, a big company who wants something delivered, the easiest way to deliver something sometimes is the way you want to deliver it. But then they've got business logic that because of X, Y, and Z, you have to do this other complicated five things, five other steps, blah, blah, blah. Not your way of doing it, but you're going to do it and you're going to like it. Some of the things that you will not be able to change. Like you're always going to have to do the Saturday morning bike rides even though you want to sleep in. The other thing, and this is for me is the biggest thing, is that planning is now a group activity. So instead of two people going and locking themselves in a room and then delivering you know, from the mountain these two scrolls that are supposed to follow, it's now literally a group activity where all the people from their side who need to be involved, who can veto things, who can provide input, who can say like, no, you need to use these parameters instead of these parameters, they're all in the room when we're talking about what needs to get built next. They're all in the room when we're reviewing tickets, and they're all in the room when we say, okay, we're gonna take these seven tickets, we're gonna do these. Do you guys agree with what these say? You can read them, there's no weird questions, you like that, okay, make sure that you add your comments now so that we can pull them into our next sprint. And so, at every, every given time, uh, you, any given time during a sprint, like you know exactly what's going on, you know exactly what's coming down the pike, and you also know that if your ticket that like you're very wanting to have done this sprint isn't gonna get done, you know or you have an idea of like maybe it's the next one or maybe it's the next one, you don't have to worry that your ticket's gonna die somewhere because uh, it did get attention. And so the best, Part of this is that everyone knows what's going on with the project. Like almost to the point where they're like, Stephanie, stop telling us what's going on. We know. But everyone knows what's going on because we do. Um, so there's a, there's a thing in public speaking where you have to tell them what you're going to tell them. You tell them and then you tell them what you told them. That's constantly what we do. We meet and we say, here's the sprint that we're in. Here's what we're working on. Here's the sprint that we're going to be doing. Everybody okay with that? Here's the stuff that we just did. It's like that whole thing of you know planning, uh, prioritization, and then uh, ticket testing and demo. Like they they see the ticket at three points in the life cycle. They see it being developed. They see it being worked on, and then they see it being actually tested and demoed to them. So there's there's never a chance for a ticket to just suddenly appear finished or or pushed to production that no one actually saw. Um, and so the big thing about this is that is that at any given time. Everyone on your team is informed, everyone on your team is empowered, and everyone on your team feels like they actually can control the destiny of the project because they're informed enough to say, like, I see a problem, I'm gonna say something about it, or uh, I don't need to worry about this because I know that so-and-so has it taken care of. And the reason that we're able to do this is that we go back to that, um, that agile theory of, you know, you fail fast and you fail often. If you think something's gonna work, try it it might not work. Like we've already learned a couple things that we went in being like, we're, we've got this. And then being like, okay, maybe we don't. We should rethink how we want to do that. But the idea of that you want to be better, you want to be better as a group, and you want to deliver a really cool product, like you can't do that if there's something visibly wrong. Like if, if you're riding a bike and there's like a sound happening, like you want to see what that sound is and fix it if it's a problem. Same thing with the team. Like if it's a problem now, it's not going to just suddenly be better later. You have to address whatever that thing is that's fucking up your life. And that's what's working for us is that, you know, we're not perfect now, but we're so much better than we were two months ago. If you would have asked me, you know, when I first did this presentation, I was actively salty. That's where that title came from. But now I'm looking at this and I'm like, this feels like it's wrong because I don't feel this way anymore. Like we've changed so much, we've come so far. And where we are now, like we're working as a team, like we know, like we know uh, that like the project is going to happen. The product is launching in like three or four weeks and we're not worried about it because we know exactly what's left, how it's gonna happen, who's gonna do it. 
We know all the weird like risks that are happening at the end, like we're still waiting on English translations, but we know that that's what we're waiting on. We, we don't have this idea that like behind some corner there's this giant monster of something that is yet undefined and is going to be thrown at us at the last minute. If we've talked to death about this project, we know that like it's in good it's in a good place. The other thing is that because we're not having people come in and say, hey, I need you to spend time on this. Hey, I don't like the way that this looks. Because people have learned how to MVP a ticket, we're not, we're, we've spent like 200 less hours in one month than we had in a previous month. And we've actually delivered more valuable stuff at the end because we're not spinning our wheels, developing stuff that no one's even gonna notice. No one's gonna notice like three pixels off. And if they do, we'll fix it later. Questions? Yeah. Um, so, uh, you said that you don't recommend writing all your tickets um, at the start of an agile process, but are there ever tickets that you do write because you know they need to happen? Then, you know, how do you how do you work in a very dynamic way but still ensure that you're meeting goals? Yeah. So it goes back to that thing of like you don't want to find out that you need a second story like you know halfway through the project. So when we do that like twelve list of stuff. This is how I use Jira. I create epics out of those, and then I kind of use those to track. So like, we know that there's going to be this. We know that there's going to be that, but we don't know exactly what that's going to look like. Um, what we will do sometimes is we'll have, so like well, one of the things that was really important to our project is that we knew that everything had to follow UX. And so what we would do is we would say, you know, in three or four sprints, we're going to try and get started on blah. So let's figure out what needs to go into that blah and we'll have UX get started on it so that there's like a path, like a scout out there, you know, figuring out what it is that that's gonna look like. Um, and so that gives us like no surprises. We know that this thing is gonna happen. We don't know exactly specifically what's gonna happen in it, but we have an idea that something's coming so that it's not a surprise. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I think through that process, you kind of described a lot of red flags that you know that something was an issue and then you kind of work to resolve it. Um, other than having a lot of experience, did you find situations that you thought, like, okay, in the next project, I'm going to have to do this thing in kind of the very beginning or early in the process to identify those same sorts of red flags? Yeah. Um, yes, there are certain things that we look at and we say, like, let's never do that again. Um, but we are, are also of the, the mode of thinking that like, if you ever get in a contract that had like a thousand different clauses in it, we never want to be the kind of company that does that. We don't want to go in and say, we fear all of these things potentially happening, let's try to get ahead of them. The most that you can do, for us at least, is, is you can go in with your like, best intentions. Like now we know, like do not go in and assume that they know what PO means. Now we know that, like, that's a huge blocker. But like now we know also that we want to spend more than one day doing an on-site. Now we know we want to spend, like depending on what the project is, we want to go in and, and like ask people like how the dynamic of their organization works in an actual way. Like I don't want to see an org chart. I want you to tell me like how these things work. Um, I think a lot of it is you have to ask questions and then keep asking questions. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, I, I, one thing you mentioned in particular was that question of like, oh, you realized when somebody was going on vacation that you were not going to be able to keep working. So maybe that came up as a thing, like maybe you just present that scenario to somebody and say, yeah, like, no, that's right, a great idea. If you're going to be gone for two weeks in a project, like, what do we do? And if they, if everybody points to somebody else, maybe that's the actual problem. Yeah, we didn't even think about that. Like we had, we had said at the beginning, like well, let's have a shared calendar of for when people go on vacation, but we didn't actually come up with a contingency plan of when someone does. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that's uncommon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm totally with you that a race is a waste of time. So obviously, when you're having this meeting to just talk through roles and responsibilities, mm -hmm. still to at least capture it somewhere, like super high level, like what is the best way that you find them? Yeah, so, so to go back to my, my first presentation that is not here for you guys to look at for reference, um, but I originally like, started doing DrupalCon, and so I'm super familiar with the importance of having a roles and responsibility like, book. Um, I would do it that way rather than a RACI because a RACI is so, like, it's, 
it's so cold and like it's really hard to actually like there's with races you tend to get like a title versus a role which doesn't tell you what the role actually does and so what i like to do is say like okay if we have what we do is we do um uh, the review process. So, like, if, so in, the, in the life cycle of a ticket, here's what's going to happen. I, at this stage, who needs to see it? Write that down. At this stage, who needs to see it? Write that down. At this stage, who can block this from happening? Write that down and use red. But like, it's you need to figure out like, and that's where we got our definition of done from. Was you know we learned when we had a ticket, the developers will write the ticket. When the developers are done writing the ticket, we're going to review it with the entire team, including the, um, the project team, and they have the responsibility of saying, if you implement it like this, we're not going to accept it. If you implement it like this, we will accept it. Uh, it you need to make sure that it includes this, this, and this. This needs to be hard-coded, blah. Once it was past them, the visionaries got to say, do it or don't do it, because the visionaries can't make the decision to do it or not do it if like, all that information is not provided. So the decision, so this decision whether or not that ticket dies or goes into the backlog, which is where it dies, um, or it moves forward, is like that needs to happen. And then once that is defined, then it goes into the priority, um, the priority order. From the priority order, it gets built. Once it's being built, like depending on if it's got design implications or not, it goes to um, the UX person on their side who will give it like a design review, UX review, whatever. Um, then it'll go to our designer, and he'll look at it because he'll look at different things than she would look at. And then from there, it goes back to us for browser testing, and then it goes back to them, or it goes to our team for uh, code review. Then they get a PR into their bid bucket so that their uh, IT guy can look at it and do the code review for their side. And then it goes to their business analyst who looks at it and makes sure that it does the things like from a business perspective that it needs to do. And then it goes to the visionaries. And then when it's done with the visionaries, it gets pushed to production. But that's the life cycle of one ticket. Uh, but because we had that, like, here's what needs to happen, we figured out, like, who could block at all of those different places. Like, we found out that if it touches finance, it leaves the project team and goes way to finance land. We would not have known that had we not put it in the context of a ticket. Anyone else? Cool. All right. You're free to go.